Good morning. <laughs> Cork up a preacher for five weeks, and what do you think's going to happen? <laughs> Cancel your lunch reservations. We're going on. <laughs> no, it's, so, it's just so grand to be back, uh, ready to bring, uh, hopefully, God's word to you and to meet you at his table. Uh, you had some great preaching while I was gone. Uh, Listen to all the sermons, and uh, they were excellent. I know your worship was soaring, and it was good for us to be together as a church. And also really nice to be back in our respective services. I always thank you for the time away just to uh, refresh physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, uh, but truly dreamy to spend um, so much time uh, in the Psalms and connecting the Psalms, various Psalms to the life of Jesus, getting ready for next Lent when we go deep into that. It was um, yes, just a glorious time for which I am grateful and hope you will get the benefit from that. Uh, so today, before we get started on a, a 6,000-week series on Ephesians, <laughs> not really, it's, it's going to be long, though. We start next week in Ephesians. I wanted to lift out a just wonderful psalm, one of my favorites, Psalm 73. It's a journey psalm. It moves from one emotional state to another. And like any good story, it has a crucial turning point that changes everything. So we'll try to get that today. Let's ask the Lord to do his work. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Lord Jesus, how glad we are to be in your presence. How glad we are that death did not defeat you, but that as the risen and ascended Lord, you even now send down your Holy Spirit as we cry out for him to take the words off the page and apply them to our hearts to meet us and let us see you in the breaking of the bread. We ask that for our sake and your glory. Amen. So Psalm 73, see if you can detect the movement that comes in this story psalm. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the wicked, the arrogant, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they, they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. So I thought, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and tried to wash my hands in innocence. For all the day long, I've been stricken, rebuked every morning. Now if I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the very generation of your children. When I thought how to understand all of this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as but phantoms. So when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me to glory. So whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. As for me, it is good to be near God. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for training, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness so that well, Psalm 73 ends in a beautiful place. It's a journey out of one state to another. And it's as if the psalmist has climbed up a mountain pass and arrived on the other side of the mountain to a valley that's hidden, tucked in the mountains, a valley of green grass and peacefulness. 
Psalm 73 arrives at an oasis for our hearts. I mean, just listen to these words. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth I desire besides you. For my flesh and my heart may fail, but you, God, are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For me, it is good to be near God. I feel more peaceful just saying those words. It's as if the chaos has gotten ordered. As if the upside down world has turned right again. As if I'm understanding that Jesus is taking care of everything and I can rest. That's where we want to get. But we know we're not there. We've got to follow the psalmist in his journey and think about where he begins. Because in the beginning, if he's walking towards that hidden valley, he is walking alongside a cliff, along a mountain pass that is full of rocks and is slippery and there is imminent danger. It would be so easy to fall off into the abyss and never reach that valley because he's dealing with particular emotions. Ones we know and don't like to admit. The emotion of envy, indignation, jealousy. Because he says, when I looked at the arrogant, I envied them. I was indignant at the state of the proud. I just couldn't believe it. How those people get away with everything. And I keep getting crushed. Do you relate to that? Have you said something like that in your mind in the last week, the last month? How come the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer? How come bad people get away with everything? They don't even look like they feel guilty. And I always get caught. I always feel bad. What's the deal with those people? Is no one going to catch them? Why do the arrogant get away with such proud talk? I could never let that come outside my mouth. We're dealing with an emotion. It's one of the seven deadly sins. Envy slash jealousy. It's the one we least like to admit. I don't mind admitting that I'm greedy, lustful, everybody is. Proud, of course. But if someone says to you, are you jealous? You always answer, no, you know you do. Because to be jealous means to admit something matters to me. And if something matters to me and you know it, then I'm vulnerable. And if I've been found out to be vulnerable before I wanted to be when I was trying to hide it, then I could be in trouble. You could hurt me. So no, I'm not jealous. No, I'm not envious. And yet, we compare ourselves to each other all the time, don't we? Oh, look what happened. Bless her heart. We compare so that we can maybe admire, more often than not, pity, or usually just hate them for having what we don't have. This is what's going on with the psalmist. At both an individual level, why does she get more than I? And at the macro level, how come those people who don't worry about God who think that they're the end of all things, that they're the top. How do they keep going? Why do we get crushed? It's as if this psalm was written three weeks ago, not 3,000 years ago. Well, that's movement one. This is the slippery path the psalmist is on. I'm about to fall. My foot had almost slipped because I envied the arrogant. But there's a whole description. You can read it later this afternoon. And I do commend Psalm 73 to you. If you want to just go ahead and get mad at the arrogant, you can just read this. Wonderful descriptions of how, you know, cool they think they are. It's great because you're going to get satisfaction. But it all turns around verse 13. He says, when I considered this, it was wearisome. Totally get that. If you're trying to figure out why do proud people get away with it and humble people don't get away with it, why do bad people get more 
in this life and good people don't, you're going to get tired of trying to figure out the arithmetic, divine arithmetic of how that works. Something else has to happen. And for the psalmist, the turning point was, this was wearisome to me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. In other words, the turning point from being caught in an envy, jealous, indignant trap is a movement, a change of place from out there to in here. From the world that always presents itself as the only game, the most important game, the most urgent game, to arriving in a place that has a story much older than we are. I mean, the very architecture of this place directs us upwards. Some of y'all have really nice houses, but probably not 42-foot ceilings. I hope you do. I want to come over. Have me. I'll try not to envy you. But we, <laughs> we arrive in this house to be sheltered under something that simultaneously as it shelters us, elevates us and says there is more going on than my little life. We read from a book whose stories are 20 to 30 centuries old so that we can get a narrative that is way deeper, way higher, way truer than my little strutting and fretting my hour upon the stage. I come into this place to learn it's not all about me. There's a whole lot more going on. We make our way up to this table where we discover we're all connected through our mutual need to receive from the Lord's own hand his life-giving body and blood through this sacrament. And we get sent out of here with our focus reoriented to realize I'm going out into the world not just to make as much money as I can or have as many experiences as I might want or to be the most popular. I'm on my way out with life-giving news about how you can get real forgiveness for sticky guilt, about how you can find real presence inside your emptiness, about how your disordered life can be reordered. I felt it in here. I'm sent out to tell of his good works. That's why we gather, to build on what Alex said last week. But one of the most important things we do is that we're a truth-telling place. We discover how small we are and how great is our God. And we also discover the realism that we are mortal. So you're looking now at the bottom of a of a fresco, a painting that you would recognize. Masaccio's Trinity in Florence was this magnificent look at the Father holding the cross while the Son suffers for our sake and the Spirit hovers between. But at the bottom of that painting, at pretty much eye level to the viewer, which you still nevertheless see because you're looking up, is a skeleton on a sarcophagus. You see that? Bones lying on a slab. Now, the words that are printed in Latin there are really pretty important. Again, you wouldn't necessarily be able to translate those immediately, but the skeleton is speaking to the viewer of the art. And he says, I once was what you are. What I am now, however, you will be. Do you see that? These are words to the viewer. Hey, I used to have flesh and blood. I used to be able to walk around and go to churches and see great art or go to museums. It was great. I was warm. But I just want to remind you, what I am now, you soon will be. Bones on a slab at best. And the fact of this is not morbid. It is entirely freeing. Because all of a sudden, with the psalmist, we're realizing when I went into the sanctuary of our God, I discerned their end. We are all on a collision course with death. The only variable is time. But the time, in any case, is not long. Whether it's 80 years or 8 seconds, it's nothing. 
In other words, I realize the arrogant and the proud, nobody gets away with anything forever. We will all stand before our Creator soon. And the question will be, some of us will arrive with our hands trying to hold the life that we said was mine and mine alone and discover that my hands are completely empty. I thought I was my own God and suddenly I realize I am not. And I've got nothing. But others will arrive having emptied themselves in faith and service and trust and realizing what I'm holding in my hands is the creator God who's been with me all this time and now I'm in your presence what I've always longed for. Mortality has a way of equalizing everybody. And the recognition of my mortality is a freedom from myself and from envy. So that's what turns the psalmist. It turns him to say, so my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Now, almost, you want to kind of correct Holy Scripture here. Just kidding. Don't bring me up on charges. But really, my flesh and my heart may fail. <laughs> my flesh and my heart will fail. I will lose my nerve. My courage will wither. My carcass will decay. My energy will cease. It's not a may. It's a will. It's going to happen. It is happening. Why is it so important to know that? Because we, you and I, are being marketed a powerful delusion, an idea that is a complete delusion but is nevertheless appealing to our vanity and attractive to our ambitions and is all around us in the liberal left and the righteous right and all in between, in the entrepreneurs and the capitalists and in the pipe dreams of the communists. Everywhere in the West, from every side, we are marketing this delusion. It goes something like this. I believe that it's just possible that I could actually hold my truest self in my hands. I could know who I am and what I desire, and I could, if I try really hard and give it my best, express my truest self and carve out a place for me to be my glorious self that everyone will recognize, and in doing that, I will be fulfilled. I can get scoop up. I can gather the essence of me. I can find it. And I can, by exercise of skill and power and discipline, express it and cause everyone to acknowledge it. And then I'll be okay. Is that possible? Can you find yourself? If you find yourself, can you hold yourself as kind of a ball of desire and ambition and need for creative expression and then express it and get everybody to acknowledge it? Well, suppose you could. I'm not saying you can't, but suppose you, let's just try that on. If you can have that glorious hour where you have truly found and expressed yourself and it's recognized. The problem is you can't hold it. Somebody's going to win the Olympic 100 meter dash. But they can't always stay that fast. Would that be the pinnacle? Could you live from that? You can grab and know yourself and start to express it. The problem is somebody is always going to knock you off. Simple betrayal. Or they'll just fail you. You've got the greatest business model in the world and it's all flowing and your employees go on strike. Or COVID comes. Something always happens. Worst of all, you fail yourself. The moment comes when you realize your dream and you're stepping onto the stage in front of the enormous audience and you forget your darn lines. 
you finally get a chance to make the presentation of the world's next innovation in software, and you're a computer genius, but you're also the one who forgot to charge your computer the night before, and it runs out of power. You signed the biggest contract to recognize your artistic creativity and you signed the contract and now all the work is due and you don't have a creative idea in your head. It's a delusion to think that I can grasp myself and hold it and therefore fulfill myself and make everybody recognize it. My flesh and my heart will fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It requires stepping out of the illusion. And we don't give that up easily, do we? I mean, I know that that dream that's marketed to me doesn't work, but I'm still putting on happy face, still telling my kids and grandkids, you can be whatever you want and then you'll be happy. Still pretending I can chase this and make it happen and when it doesn't happen, I'm still falling into the same place the psalmist fell, into envy of those who seem to have done it, into jealousy of those who got more, into being dismayed that it's all so inequitable and unjust. It's a dead end. When the psalmist went into the sanctuary of God and got his priorities reordered, he discovered the peace of releasing into a strength that is not his own. I'm at the end of myself already. But you are the strength of my heart. Then, everything started opening up for him. He thought, you know, when I was that way, all envious, I was a brute before. I was like a beast before you, O oh Lord. Then I discovered that nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. You will take me to your glory. And note that. This is really important. I am continually with you. Not you are continually with me, helping me to live the dreams that I have of what would make my life be good and successful and fulfilled. No. It's not God is my assistant in pursuing my dreams. He is wonderful. He helps me do everything I want to do. Wrong. I am continually with God. He is inviting me to participate in his glory, in his story, in his plan for the world, and therein I discover what I cannot hold on my own, that you have in the past taken me up by my right hand. You lifted me out of death. You lifted me out of myself. You lifted me into freedom. And in the present, you are guiding me continually. You're speaking to me as I seek you. And my future, while I've got to be the bones on the slab, that's not the end. You're going to take me to glory. Do you see how Psalm 73 is a preview for the story of Jesus? We will say at communion, as we do at every communion, a past, present, and future about Jesus. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. You took me by the hand. You redeemed me. You are right now giving me resurrection life and guidance. You will come again to take me and those who belong to you to glory. That's what you get when you release trying to hold your whole life in your hands and open yourself up to the strength that is God's. Good news, I'm not going to go 55 minutes. Bad news, we got a third to go here. Here's what happens. That leads the psalmist to a conclusion. There is nothing on earth I desire beside you. He started out envious. He's concluding there's nothing on earth I desire beside you. You're first. That's just beautiful. I find it completely daunting. Do you think that's true about you? There is nothing on earth I desire beside you, O oh God. I desire so many things. Holy moly. I want to be right. I want to be well. 
I want to be in control. I want to be appealing. I want to be admired. I want to have enough means to do what I want to do when I want to do it. I want to be secure. I want to be able to get out of town if I need to. I want, I want, I want. Is it possible that there is nothing on earth I desire besides you, oh God? This line ruined me in the last week until it got flipped in my head. Flip it around. Okay, suppose I don't really desire God most of all, but then run a diagnostic. Start asking myself, would all abundance satisfy me if I no longer knew where to put gratitude? If I could no longer give thanks to the Father from whom all good things come? Would all security measures, all security of bank accounts and equities and security systems and an arrangement, would I feel safe and held if I no longer knew the Prince of Peace as my brother? If I could experience every pleasure I thought of to experience, would I feel filled up from the inside if I did not have God the Holy Spirit inside my heart crying out to the Father because of the work of the Son? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. And I wouldn't know the paradoxes of Christian truth that actually lead to life. The things you can't know without knowing Jesus. That in giving, you don't end up empty, you end up filled. That in forgiving, you don't end up overlooking wrong, you end up being free from the wrongs done against you and by you. That in laying down your life, you don't lose it, you only lose your life when you try to hold it as your own. Would I give up knowing that? And suddenly I realize it's true about me and it's true about you. There is actually nothing on earth you desire more than God. Oh yeah, all week long we're tempted by this narrative, this delusion that's marketed to us to choose lesser things. But we know these lesser things without Christ at the center mean nothing. So that's what can lead the psalmist to his final conclusion and choice. He started out by saying, as for me, I mean, I know that God is good, but as for me, I was envious of the wicked. But he ends by saying, but as for me, it is good to be near God. He's made the journey over the mountain. The journey turned on entering the sanctuary of God and being taken up into God's story. So he's made a conclusion. For me, I don't know what you're going to do. I'm going to get rid of envy by being near to God, the God with whom I am continually. And that led him to the final choice. The last verse of the psalm, he says, I have made the Lord God my refuge so I may tell of all your works. Well, I don't make God my refuge. He's already my refuge. He's already the stronghold of my life. He is already the one reality, but he allows us the choice of leaning on him as the refuge, of giving up trying to lean on myself and to trust in him. I have made the Lord God my refuge by relying on him alone as my strength and my source. And that's when I realize when I leave the sanctuary, I got so many great things to say to those who are lost and weighted down and empty. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus that you don't let us be content with ourselves or our pride. Thank you that there is more, so much more. Would you feed us from your own hand as we come to your table today? Would you send us out with your praises on our lips?